Mars is a little red planet. It's about a third of the size of our own planet Earth. And it's somewhere around 200 million kilometers away from us. 200 million kilometers. If I wanted to drive this far in my car on a German highway, I would be underway for a million hours. It's somewhere a little bit over 100 years, not counting the time to take gas. And even if I took a much faster rocket, I would still be underway for about eight months. Recently, many scientists and politicians have announced their plans to send humans to Mars in more or less realistic scenarios. NASA, for example, is planning to send a handful of humans to Mars in 2035. The European Space Agency is a bit less optimistic and aims for 2050. However, on the other hand, um, private companies have boldly claimed to send humans, 100 humans, to Mars within less than a decade or so. However long it takes to finally send humans to Mars, it won't be easy. Only recently did the not-so-gentle landing of a European module remind us that not even half of all landing attempts have been successful. So if we ever want to send humans to Mars instead of just machines, there's certainly some room for improvement. So why bother? Why send humans to Mars? As a member of the human species, I'm incredibly curious. And also, I'm concerned. I know that if our own planet Earth, at some point, for, for whatever reason, will become uninhabitable, we're screwed. If someone told us that a giant asteroid would hit Earth in five years, we wouldn't have time enough to save ourselves. So instead, we should start making a plan B for our children today. But as a human and a scientist, as I said, I'm very curious. I want to see what Mars looks like. Our ancestors, they wanted to know what lies beyond the walls of their caves. They wanted to know what's beyond the boundaries of the African continent. They wanted to know what's on the other side of the Atlantic. And I want to know what Mars looks like. So if you look at the photo, you see the rover Curiosity. And you also see lots of rocks and dust. And I want to look at those rocks and read in them, like in a geology book, like in a history book. I want to learn about the past and the future of our own planet. And even if I won't be able to walk on Mars myself, I want to be sure that we don't miss a sign of life on Mars just because curiosity hasn't been programmed to look right at the right time. So let's assume my wish get grant gets granted. Let's assume someone manages to send someone. How about you? Someone manages to send you to Mars and land you safely on the surface. Then what? Mars is not an easy place to live in. You're 200 million kilometers away from your friends and from your family. You have no phone, and your email communication is underway 10 up to 20 minutes just to reach its destination, each direction, and every single time, even if you just want to know what's up. If you want to go outside, you have to wear a spacesuit because the air is so thin and so toxic. But going out in a spacesuit means you're never actually really outside. You cannot feel the wind or the sun on your skin. Instead, you feel the inside of your suit. Even when you touch the rocks around you, you feel the inside of your gloves. And if it's not the air or the lack of air that's killing you, it's the space radiation. So because Mars is so harsh, there is no life on Mars like we know it from Earth. There are no plants, there are no animals. And the planet itself is so dry, there are no lakes or no rivers, there's no rain. So how can you bear living in such a desolate environment? I know some technological help, obviously, but how can you bear living there mentally? I've tried it, I've tested it. I've lived at a research base called High Seas on a remote volcano somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. And I've lived there under pretty much the same conditions that I just described to you. And I've lived there with five other people for an entire year. So now you could say, well, that's incredibly stupid of you, but what do I care? <laughs> and my answer is that life on Mars is actually not so different from life on Earth. On the contrary, some aspects of life on Mars 
are so surprising, or you might find surprisingly relevant to life on Earth. And I will now tell you four little stories that hopefully make you envy life on Mars, at least just a little bit. I mean, sure, there's some negative side effects like the environment trying to kill you. And indeed, I had a crewmate who was getting increasingly scared of the environment. They were afraid of putting on a suit and going outside. They were afraid of walking on the admittedly difficult terrain. So they stopped. They stopped going outside, they stopped putting on a suit, and they stopped put it, uh, walking on the terrain. And as a result, they became less and less capable of walking on the terrain. And then they spent the rest of their days complaining about not being able to go outside. At the same time, there was a crew member who went outside more than 100 times. Over the year, she traversed almost 1,000 kilometers. And as a result, she became very proficient. Proficient walking on the terrain, proficient working in a suit. Humans are living in Greenland, they're living in Antarctica. On the other extreme, they're living in deserts. Humans are extremely adaptable, if they're willing. The conditions in our lives are not always in our favor. And then we can succumb and we can lament over how hard we have it. Or we can f face our challenges and try to live up to them. It's a choice that we can make. On simulated Mars, I was conducting a little experiment. The rocks there are about as dry as on real Mars, but they do contain some water. And I tried to extract this water and collect it. It's a very slow process. And in my left hand, you can see a cylinder that contains about 400 milliliters of water, which is about the size of a drinking glass. And it took several days to collect this amount of water. So you could say that water on Mars is precious. And consequently, we had a little shower competition going on in the crew. <laughs> Who could take the shortest showers? So I personally was taking a shower every three or four days, and um, typically around two, maximum three minutes. And I lost the competition, by far. The shortest shower that we were taking in the crew lasted 24 seconds. <laughs> so now imagine my very first time coming back on Earth and standing in front of a pool. <laughs> I was sweaty, I was dirty, and I was supposed to jump into this pool of clean, precious water. This pool evaporated so much water, the amount of water that I had collected on Mars, on simulated Mars, over the course of several days, evaporated from this pool in a matter of less than five minutes. Eventually, I did go in. It took some convincing. It's okay. That's how they do it here on Earth. <laughs> it's totally fine to waste a pool full of clean, drinkable water. It's totally okay to pollute the rivers and the lakes that we're drinking from. It's not sustainable, and we know it's not sustainable, but everyone does it, so it's okay for me to do it too. Right? I've mentioned before that Mars is an environment that's very keen on killing you. And indeed, if something happens to you, and even if it's something as ridiculously mundane as a kitchen accident, the nearest hospital is eight months away. And even on our simulated Mars, the nearest hospital was half a day away. So early on in the mission, when the terrain was still foreign to me, and I was walking outside in my suit, when suddenly my air supply failed. The fan that was supposed to pump air for breathing into my helmet stopped working from one second to the next. So of course I could have started running around and crying and um, wasting the very little air that I had left. Instead, I remained calm and walked back to the habitat where I could take my helmet off. And I did suffer from the lack of oxygen and the um, surplus of CO2. And by the time I reached the habitat, even though it was the whole incident lasted less than 10 minutes. I was extremely exhausted. Of course, on Earth, it's much harder to die than just a fan failing. But I'm proud of myself that I, I did the only thing that I could have possibly done on, on Mars. I kept my helmet on, and I pulled through. So why am I telling you this story? When I returned to Earth, 
I went to the train station. And I missed my train by like one, one or two minutes. And my escort who was bringing me was stunned at my comment. There will be another one in an hour. And she just couldn't understand how I could remain so calm. And I, on the other hand, I couldn't understand, I'm still not quite sure why I was supposed to be stressed out. In fact, right now it's very hard to stress me out about anything. <laughs> as long as I have air to breathe. So this photo is, of course, fake. <laughs> However, if you have six people in a tight space over a long period of time, you cannot avoid conflicts. And in fact, my best friend in the habitat started getting on my nerves after a couple of months because she was putting things away, which is nice because that was keeping the habitat tidy and clean. On the other hand, it was annoying me because I had to search for my things. So at some point, I was very close to snapping at her, leave my stuff alone. And then maybe she could have replied something like, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a pigsty. And then maybe the next morning, the next day, we wouldn't even have looked at each other anymore. So instead, I walked to her and told her, hey, listen, it's very nice that you're keeping the habitat tidy, but it's frustrating for me to always have to look for my own stuff. And her reaction was twofold. First, she was surprised. She didn't even know she had this habit. And she didn't even believe me until I caught her in the act and pointed it out to her. <laughs> and then she stopped. She stopped putting stuff away that wasn't her own. Of course, occasionally she still made a slip. And when it happened, I just grinned at her because I saw her effort. Conflicts do happen. And the important thing is that we address them as early and as calmly as possible before they can escalate into solid arguments. Besides, everyone has their quirks. You have yours, I have mine, everybody. If you overlook mine, I will overlook yours. And this is especially true if you're living inside a tight space like a Mars habitat. But honestly, I wish we would treat each other like that on Earth more often. Mars has so many things to explore. It has caves that are larger than caves on Earth. It has a canyon that is larger than the Grand Canyon. And it has the largest mountain in the solar system. Mars has rocks that might hold the key to the, to the future of our own planet. And even if we don't find any signs of life on Mars, I'm convinced that we will be able to live on Mars. And the most successful human Martian is someone who can adapt to all sorts of different environments and situations. With someone who uses their resources sustainably, who is resilient to stresses, and who handles conflicts maturely. As I've said before, life on Mars is actually not so different from life on Earth. Thank you.